Hey everybody, this is Mr. Bortnick for AP Calculus AB, Unit 1, Limits and Continuity. Today we're going over the second section in 1.6, Topic 1.6b, Determining Limits Using Algebraic Manipulation. Enjoy today's notes. All right, today we are starting 1.6b, which is a continuation uh, from our factoring and expanding techniques from last lesson. Uh, we're focusing today on how you find limits using algebraic manipulation. So determining limits using algebraic manipulation. The first thing that I would wanna emphasize uh, is that when we are given an equation, that the first thing that we should attempt to do is this thing that is called direct substitution. And I wanna highlight this. This is always the first thing you should try. And again, this is if you're being given an equation and they're asking you to find a limit. The first thing that you should try is this thing that's called direct substitution. What does that mean? We are gonna directly substitute the uh, value in for the x's in the function and see what happens. So in this case, for number one, where it says the limit as x approaches negative one of the equation x squared plus 2x minus 4, we are going to directly substitute that negative one in for each of the x's in this equation. If we do that, we're going to find out that this limit is equal to negative one quantity squared plus two times negative one minus four. And so negative one squared is one. We've got two times negative one, which is a negative two minus four. Altogether, that's going to give us negative five as that answer. And so that is the limit as x approaches negative one for the given function. For number two, we have a slightly different thing. Notice that this is saying the limit as x approaches two for the function six. Six is my function. And so in this case, we notice if we try direct substitution that there's nowhere here for us to plug in that two. And so because of that, if our function is, uh, is six, for example, if we think about the line y is equal to six, you might remember that a uh, equation like that would simply be a horizontal line. And so we would have a line that looks like that with a height of six. And so no matter what the x value is, the output for that function would be six itself. And so six would be our answer. We were not able to plug in the, the two anywhere. It just spit out six because it's a function that is a horizontal line. All right, now the fun ones. Number three and number four. Um, as we had said before, um, when we're given an equation and we're being asked to find a limit, the first step is going to be to try that direct substitution. So I'm gonna try my direct substitution. I'm gonna put just ds to represent that, that I'm doing this. And if we do that, we see that we would get four times zero quantity squared minus five times zero, all divided by zero. And if we simplify this, that this is gonna be equal to zero over zero. This has a special name in calculus, uh, zero over zero. It's not just undefined, but it's something that we call indeterminate form. Any limit that gives us a zero over zero is what's referred to as indeterminate form. We don't really know what the limit's gonna be. We don't have enough information to figure out what that is uh, as the equation is written. And so in this case, direct substitution was not enough for us to find what the actual value for this limit is. So what we're going to try is we're going to uh, use some techniques uh, that we talked about last lesson to factor and see if we can cancel parts of these equations. Specifically, if I have that limit as x approaches zero of that four x squared minus five x over x, one thing that I might do is try to factor that numerator. And we could see that if we factor that numerator, finding that GCF, that the numerator would become x times four x minus five, and then the denominator would still have that x in it. The nice thing about doing this is we'll notice that our x's would cancel each other out. So this x cancels out with this x. And so we're gonna say here that this is gonna be equal to the limit as x approaches zero of four x minus five. And now that we've simplified it, we're gonna go back and try that direct substitution in again. And so I'm gonna try to just plug in my zero and see what happens. If we do that, we're gonna find out that this limit is equal to four times zero minus five, 
or negative five as our answer for that problem. So again, in these types of problems, you know, we always start with direct substitution. Sometimes it works out that, you know, we just get a numerical answer. Other times, maybe we need to do an additional step in terms of, uh, of simplifying, uh, factoring and simplifying before we can find out what that limit is. Let's try number four. So for number four, we've got the limit as x approaches negative seven of this two x squared plus 13 x minus seven all divided by x plus seven. Uh, what we can notice here is if we, if we do our direct substitution first, what we're gonna end up with in this case, again, if you, if you plug in that negative seven and you test it out, is we end up with this zero over zero, this indeterminate form. Um, one thing I wanna be really careful of as we get ready for this AP exam, it would be incorrect for us to write that this is equal to zero over zero. Because if this were the free response section on the AP exam, we wanna avoid writing false things. And this is something that if this were a problem that they were asking you to do and you wrote equals zero over zero, even though the rest of your work might be right, they would remove a point because you're saying that this is equal to zero over zero. And obviously we can't be equaling something that's dividing by zero. So I would avoid when you're doing these types of problems to ever write that it equals zero over zero. Um, in my previous problem, you'll notice I didn't say that the limit was equal to it. I just sort of showed my separate work. Uh, the limit was not equal to zero, the is uh, equal to zero over zero, just that expression is equal to zero over zero. So be really careful when you're doing that. Again, that's a, that's a common space where people lose points on quizzes, tests, and, and, and the AP exam as well. So we never wanna say that that equals zero over zero. Sometimes people put like a, a arrow to say that it's approaching zero over zero. Uh, that would be more appropriate if you feel like you want to write something for it. Um, so in this case, now that we've got indeterminate form, we're gonna try to factor uh, our numerator. Using our techniques from last week, uh, we can try the x method to factor that numerator. And so because I've got this equation 2x squared plus 13x minus 7, 2x squared plus 13x minus 7, if we do our x method here, we're going to have a negative 14 on the top. We're going to have a 13 on the bottom. That tells me that these two side numbers are going to be, looks like positive 14 and negative 1. If we then rewrite that middle, uh, this equation, we've got 2x squared plus 14x minus 1x minus 7. We're going to factor both the left and the right sides. If we do that, we're going to get 2x times x plus 7, and then a negative 1 times x plus 7. Altogether, this is going to become 2x minus 1 times x plus 7 for the factored form for that equation. So I'll leave this over here as side work. If you're unsure of what I just did, I would go back and rewatch the uh, 1.6a video on big X factoring methods. It's the last technique I talked about in that video. But essentially what we just did is we just said that uh, if we factor that numerator, we've got the limit as X approaches uh, negative seven, of the numerator which becomes 2x minus 1 times x plus 7 and then in that denominator is still going to be this x plus 7. Conveniently for us we notice that these x plus 7 factors are going to cancel each other out and if we continue on we're going to now say that this is equal to the limit as x approaches negative 7 of 2x minus 1. Now that we've simplified we're going to try that direct substitution again and so this is going to be equal to uh, what looks like 2 times negative 7 minus 1 or negative 15 as our final answer for that problem. Uh, so a recap for number 4. We, we started with direct substitution first. We saw that it was going to indeterminate form. We were careful to not write that it equals 0 over 0 because we cannot equal to something dividing by 0. We then factored, in this case I used my big X method from our previous lesson uh, in order to do that. We were then able to cancel out some factors and then try direct substitution again to get our final answer of negative 15. Excellent. Let's try number five, an example here where the limit does not exist. We know that graphically that we might have a limit that does not exist and that's where the limit from the left and the limit from the right don't go to the same space. But how would you tell if you're doing this with an equation. And for example, we were not looking at a graph. Well, we try our direct substitution first, same story as before. 
if we do this, uh, we're going to end up with what? Negative 6 squared plus 4 times negative 6 plus 3, all divided by negative 6 plus 6. So I'm seeing what looks like 36 minus 24. So that's going to be 12 plus 3. So I have 15 divided by 0. Uh, that is not indeterminate form. And so for me, this is sort of a big signal here. Uh, if I were, were doing this problem, I'd be like, mm, maybe factoring is not going to work out in this problem. But let's try it out anyway, just to see what happens. Um, Generally, I would try that factoring technique in ones that are in indeterminate form that are that zero over zero. This 15 over zero is not going to be uh, not going to work out. So let's try it. If we factor that numerator using our x method, that numerator would become x plus 3 times x plus 1. The denominator would stay the same. We still have an x plus 6. Notice here that for this statement, none of our factors are going to cancel out in that numerator and denominator. There's nothing that we can do that would cancel this out. And so because of that, this is really as simplified as this equation gets. And so we can conclude that the limit does not exist. The limit does not exist for this problem. And again, this is a huge indicator to me that, that likely the factoring method wasn't going to work because it didn't give me indeterminate form when I did my direct substitution first. All right, next, we're going to talk about some special trigonometric limits. Uh, specifically, there are some limits involving sine and cosine that the AP exam expects you to have memorized, um, even as early as, as this, er this early in the, uh, the class. Um, and they're ones that come up on both like the multiple choice and, and the free response of the AP exam. So they're ones that are worth knowing. Uh, we will learn later, uh, probably in chapter three or chapter four, the, a way to prove what these are. Um, so, so don't think, you know, I'm just saying memorize this for the sake of it. We're going to learn a different technique in, in chapter three and chapter four that's going to allow us to find these limits. But we don't have the ability to do that right now with what we know. So for now, we're going to memorize what they're equal to and we're going to use them in some problems uh, that allow us to work on this algebraic manipulation. Um, the first one that we've got is the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x is always equal to 1. So the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x always equals 1. This is also true if I flip that fraction and I do the limit as x approaches 0 of x over sine of x. That is also equal to 1. They're the same. Notice that these are just reciprocals of each other. We flipped the fraction. For the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 minus cosine x all divided by x, that limit is going to be equal to 0. Or, if we uh, reverse the order of that numerator, it ends up being the exact same thing. It still ends up being 0. So notice those numerators are almost exactly the same, except we reversed the order of it. These are trig limits that are, again, sort of like worth noting if you are taking your notes in your notebook, and I hope you are. I would put some stars uh, around this. This is something that we're going to need to memorize and something that um, we're going we're gonna to want really for the rest of this chapter. Um, one thing I would really heavily emphasize as you are taking notes on this, notice all of these limits that we're talking about are limits as x approaches 0. These rules that we're talking about only work when x is approaching 0. If this was the limit as x approaches 5 or limit as x approaches any, any other number, these rules would not work. It is only for x approaches 0, uh, and so that is uh, our special trig limits. All right, we're going to do 6, 7, and 8, uh, but I'm going, to, I'm going to move to the next page just so we've got... Well, actually, we can do 6 here. Um, so for 6, we've got the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of 3x over x. Now, even though this is not technically in parentheses, it is assumed here that this 3x is in parentheses. It is inside of that sine function. And so we can't like, you know, remove the 3 or anything like that because it is inside of that sine function here. Um, and so for me, what I'm, if I'm looking at our special trig limits here, to me this looks a lot like this one that's up here. But notice for this uh, special trig limit to work, these values would need to be exactly the same. And I have this pesky 3 that's here that's, that's not allowing those values to be the same so that I could just find that limit and say that it's 1. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually manipulate my, uh, my function. 
um, in order to create those values to be the same, to get a 3x in that numerator inside of the sign and a 3x in the denominator. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, well, this is the limit as x approaches 0 of, I've got that sign of 3x divided by x. What I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both the numerator and denominator by 3. So 3 here and 3 here. Now, what that's going to do is uh, it's going to allow me to have the 3x that I need in both the numerator and the denominator for me able to be able to use that special trig limit uh, of the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x, which is equal to 1. What I'm going to do with this 3 here is I'm going to use one of my uh, properties of limits, which we talked about in a previous lesson, and I'm essentially going to bring this 3, because it's just a factor, out of the limit statement. And so this is going to be equal to 3 times... Let's get the rest of this. The limit as x approaches 0 of sine of 3x divided by 3x. Now this looks like our uh, special trig limit, this one that's right here in the top left. And that limit as x approaches 0 is going to go towards 1. So I have 3 in the front times the 1. That's going to give me an overall answer of 3 for this limit. Nice, cool that we were able to use that, uh, that special trig function. Okay, for number seven, I'm gonna actually write this down here just so that we've got uh, some more room. So this is the limit as x approaches zero of sine of seven x over sine of nine x. All right, looking back up at our values, I, I'm a little confused by this because there are no rules that I see here where there's a sign in both the numerator and the denominator. So we're gonna to need to think about a creative way that we can think outside of the box to split this up. And one way to do that is to recognize just sort of how fractions work. So as a side note here, I just sort of wanna uh, give you an example. If I talk about, uh, let's say, the exa for example, five over nine, a different way that I could write that fraction is saying that this is five times one over nine. Those mean the exact same thing. So for example, 20 over 27 is the same thing as 20 times one over 27. So if I remember how this like nice little fraction trick, I can actually do that with this limit. And so we're gonna do this in the first step and you'll see what we're gonna do here. So this is gonna be equal to the limit as x approaches zero well, I'm going to split this fraction up into two parts, which is going to allow me to maybe use some different rules, uh, of sine of 7x times uh, 1 over sine of 9x. And what I'm going to also add here, and this is technically what I could do over here uh, in these as well, this, this 5 that I've got in the 5 over 9 is technically like a 5 over 1, and this 20 is like a 20 over 1. So I'm going to put this over one as well. And we know that this makes sense because when you multiply fractions, you multiply going straight across. And so these would be uh, the same value if we did that and we multiplied that out. All right, so what do we got? Let's re-add what we have. We've got this. One of our properties of limits allows us to separate limit statements that are being multiplied. So this is technically equal to the limit as x approaches 0 of the sine of 7x over 1 times the same limit, limit as x approaches 0, of 1 over sine of 9x. Notice all I did here was rewrite the, the limit statement twice. It's going to allow me to do each of these separately and then just sort of multiply these answers here together in the middle. Now, same as what we did for number 6, what I'm going to need to do is I'm going to need to multiply these fractions so that I have the same thing in the numerator and the denominator. So I have a 7x here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both my numerator and my denominator by 7x. So this is going to be so times 7x times 7x. And then over here, because I have a 9x inside of that sign, I'm going to multiply by 9x in the numerator and 9x in the denominator. If we do this, we're going to see that from, that from these two properties up here on the top, right, these, uh, 
these top two, the ones regarding sines, that this part is going to go towards 1, and this part is going to go towards 1 if we do that. And so what does that leave us with? Well, it's going to leave us with... Let's go in blue. It's going to leave us with the limit. Uh, actually, we've already taken the limit when we're doing this one, so we don't need to write that anymore. Uh, it's going to leave us with this extra 7x that's in the numerator. So 7x times that limit, which is going to become 1. And then times, over here, uh, this limit, which is going to become a 1, but this 9x is in the denominator. So times 1 over 9x, because the rest of that in green is going to go away when we take that limit. And so if we do that, this is going to be 7x times 1 times 1 times 1, all divided by 9x, 7x over 9x. Those x's will cancel, giving me my final answer, which is 7 over 9 for problem number 7. So 7 over 9 is our final answer. All right, last one for today, uh, problem number 8. Uh, if we look uh, at our sheet, this is the limit as x approaches 0 of cosine squared x minus 1, all divided by x over cosine x plus 1. Uh, this is a nice one uh, because it's, again, going back to one of our factoring techniques from last week, specifically uh, the difference of two squares, except this is using trig functions. That difference of two squares rule says that if we've got a squared minus b squared, that that's equal to a plus b times a minus b. And so in this case, if we look at that numerator, hey, I got cosine squared of x minus 1, which is technically being squared. And so if we do that, this is going to be cosine x plus 1 times cosine x minus 1. Now a brief aside here, a brief aside here uh, that I want to mention, why did we write this like, like this, this cosine squared of x? Technically what this means is cosine x quantity squared. It's the whole thing being squared. Why would we write it like this? Well, in higher level math and in AP calculus, you know, sometimes people forget their parentheses and we would certainly not want to write it like this. This would be a way that we do not want to write it because if we write it like this, the question is uh, where, like what's being squared? We have no idea. If, is the whole thing being squared like this? Or is it like this? How do you know what, what the squared is going to be on? And so the convention for higher level mathematics is to say, okay, if the whole thing is being squared like what we've got here, to not have the confusion as to what's being squared, let's move the squared onto the cosine or to that whatever trig function we're talking about to emphasize that the whole cosine of x is being squared. So in general, that's a, that's a useful thing to know. Um, cool, let's get back to this particular problem and wrap this one up. So this is the limit as x approaches 0 uh, of, if we factor that numerator, going to be cosine x plus 1 times cosine x minus 1, all divided by x times cosine x plus 1. Now that we've factored this, some magic happens. We get some canceling of factors. And so next we can say that this is equal to the limit as x approaches 0 of cosine x minus 1 all divided by x, which conveniently for us looks like this one here on the right, which we, a bottom right, which we know is equal to 0. That was one of our special trig rules for this problem. That is our examples for today. Uh, if we go on ahead, there should be some practice problems for you to try. Try them out, check your answers, and have a great rest of your day.